Hi. Hi, How are you? <laughs> Thanks for being here with us. It's truly my, my question is about taking in caring from people. And like, you know, people can bring you food and say they love you and stuff like that, but then you might spit it out. <laughs> so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on letting that in. Uh, one of the biggest questions one could ask in life, as it turns out. Um, well, on one hand, you think about why wouldn't someone, and I, I don't know you, Sarah, in particular, so I'm not going to presume you know, that I know anything about your life experience, but I do know a little bit about a lot of people's life experience, you know, which is that they never grew up and lived in an atmosphere of safety, you know, psychological safety of trust. And so there's a suspiciousness, you know, it's like, why is this person giving this to me? Like, what's their ulterior motive? And it turns out that it's not unusual uh, in the human condition for people to have ulterior motives. And so there's that first, there's that gauge of like safety versus threat. And if it feels on some level threatening based on one's life experience to make sure nothing comes in, from a defensive perspective, it makes sense not to, right? So that's that's the first order of business, to stay alive and make sure you don't get taken, taken under by someone who has not the best of intentions, right? And then there's really the kind of, to some degree, letting go of the past, and, and trust in your intuition, because there are people in, I'm sure, most of our lives that mean well. They may, they may be imperfect beings, like, I mean, I'm sure they are imperfect beings, because that's just the nature of life, to be imperfect, right? But then there's just the practice of even breathing, of being aware of the part of you that's defending and pushing it out, and then making a choice in that moment, okay, I'm going to breathe this in. And I just kind of automatically took a, an inhale when I did that. And I wasn't really thinking about that, but just my hands went to my heart because that's generally the place where we feel things. I mean, feel things all over our body, but really letting that in. So it really is a practice. And when you think about Rick's work, you know, which is basically around, not basically, but a big part of it is around self-directed neuroplasticity. There are two different ways of taking in the good. One is something happens and someone offers you something, which is what you're asking about right now. And when that offering comes to be aware of it, okay, here's an offering. And in this moment, allowing, allowing yourself to really take it in, if, if only a little bit, it doesn't have to be everything, but even a little bit is the beginning of building your kind of positive internal muscles, right? And so to be aware it's coming and then to go, okay, I'm going to let this in and be aware of the part of you that might indeed be saying, you don't deserve this, right? Because we all have these parts of ourselves. I call them traitor characters, traitor, right? That are on some level opposed to thriving. They're not evil, bad, or wrong, but they're suspicious. Right. And again, as I say, they're only paranoid if they're not out to get you, you know, in a certain way. You know, so it's like being aware of that and go, OK, now is an opportunity to really build and to open and opening versus defending are these choices that for most of us happen reflexively because it's not part of our conscious process. And so my major suggestion is to be aware, you know, of that when it shows up and to breathe it in and go, OK. I deserve this. And really, even you can even visualize it coming in. I've had people who I've worked with, like even imagine their brains changing, building new positive neural networks in that moment. And so I hope that's helpful. It is. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Okay, I have time for I think, one more person, and that is Tony. Or actually, yes, Tony. Hi. 
Don't need Talia Marks. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you again after all these generations of healers. So the last statement you made was let go of everything you don't need or something to that effect. Right. How do I know? Where is my knowing <laughs> of what I don't need? You know, it, it's funny that you should ask that because when I said that, um, I had the same thought. Really, like, how does someone actually know you know, what they don't need. And I don't know the answer to that, you know, but it's just kind of, a, it's an intuition thing. And you don't, you don't actually have to be cognizant of everything like that. It's really a practice of just kind of like letting go and say, okay, I'm going to let this, let this cleanse me. I'm just going to use my breath, you know, to clean myself out. And probably there'll be something in the, in the opening of that, of the process there which really feels like you're lightening up. You know, if you think about enlightenment as, as, as being filled with light and lightening up, and again, we all carry burdens. You know, we all, as human beings, carrying burdens is part of the humanimal experience, right? And so it's just like having the intention of letting go, you know, of those is a really good beginning, you know, to purifying yourself so to speak which is not to say you're impure i don't mean it in that way all right well yeah. thank, you. thank you very much so i'm gonna thank you and and for those of you who had questions or want to bring things up is there going to be time after this talk to you know bring up questions or you know share share something if you'd like all right so uh just to share with you before i begin what i have planned um after, at the very end of the meditation, I was just looking, I kind of scanned the, the screen, and I just had this, this just sense of um, love, really, <clears throat> and just an appreciation of our common humanity, you know, that we all are walking this planet, or some of us are, maybe are not even walking, and it's, it's very challenging being alive, being a human being, I'm, I'm very aware of that because of my own life journey. So it's just, just an appreciation of you for showing up and for Rick for having helped to create this Sangha. And so it's just, it feels good to be here. All right, so. Uh, I'm gonna begin with something that happened. I even actually thought about talking about when I was here in June and July, but. I, I didn't quite feel ready for it. I'm not quite sure exactly what readiness means. But what happened was that I wound up getting some routine blood tests uh, in March. And my PSA, uh, which is about the prostate, uh, came up high. You know, if it's over a certain number, then you go, huh, you're a urologist, if you're a man, uh, will say, hmm, this is too high. Uh, time to move to the next level of investigation. And the next level for that is what's called a K4 test, which is a cumulative you know, prostate antigens and you know, free floating. And you know, there's four different markers for that. And if, it, if your K4 score is over, I believe it was seven, that says go on to the next. Mine was like 14. So it was like, okay, on to the next. Right. I'm sure many of you here have had these experiences where you don't even know something's wrong or you do know something is wrong and you start getting tests and then there's this, this whole evaluation. Hmm, what is this? Right. And, and so obviously that can activate anxiety. All anxiety is related to death anxiety, essentially. You know, and so on to the next. I'm getting increasingly anxious about this. The next is an MRI. So I get an MRI and takes, you know, videos, an fMRI takes video images, you know, of the prostate. And I'm, I'm waiting for results. And I have a urology appointment on a Monday. And these days you actually get results oftentimes before you see your physician, which I did. And so I came home from the gym one morning on a Thursday. And I had a very long day of clients planned at that point. And I saw that the test results had come in. 
and I went, I could feel my heart like pounding there. And I, I opened it up and I saw a line in there that really had me pounding, which is it said, significant cancer likely. Now, I didn't exactly know what that meant, but it didn't sound good, right? And so I was really anxious and I wound up even canceling one of my groups at night. I just felt like I couldn't be present, you know, with that. And I was just really working with myself. I spent a good amount of time meditating and sitting, you know, with this. And then I, I went to, you know, that. so this was a Thursday and, and Rick actually came over on Saturday uh, that weekend and we were sitting outside talking you know about this and he shared something in his very ricksonian you know type of way which always has number one number two number three or you know however and you know the first one I, he he shared was you know find out what's going on that's obviously you have to find out what's what's happening and then make clear as objective as possible decisions about one's condition or one's situation which i was you know, certainly going to do two was and i love this this image scared monkey in a cave which you probably heard if you've been hanging out with him you know for a while and i was i was quite aware of that little scared monkey in me i don't know if i associated it to a cave exactly but it was it was hopping around boy and then third was really about the practice of letting go you know transcendence which i was practicing as well but i think that those are really a good way of looking at whenever you have any type of situation that's calling for your attention, that's not, shall we say, happifying, I like to make words, but that was really grabbing my attention. And so <clears throat> I wound up meditating more than usual that weekend. I went into my urologist on Monday morning and he was looking at my MRI in front of me, and he said, like, I'm not sure. I don't I, I don't think it's cancer, but I'm not really sure. But we really have to do a biopsy on this. And uh, so that was the next step. I ended up getting a biopsy, and that was not fun, to put it mild, mildly. Uh, and so the results are going to come back in a week. And you can imagine like waiting for these. And I'm sure you know many of you out there have been waiting for some type of medical uh, results and had, shall we say, some degree of anxiety about waiting. I did. And I just kept working with it, like meditating and just breathing with it and go, okay, if this is my time, I don't, I don't know. But that's the way it is in life, right? You just don't know when your time is up, right? And so I was really sitting with that. And here I am, I'm 69, I'll be 70 in December, we have a friend who some of you may have known, Terry Patton, you know, who well, on his 70th birthday, he didn't feel well. And he went, he wound up going to the emergency room and boom, he found out that he had stage four cancer and he was dead within seven months. And I'd known Terry for well over 30 years. So it was like, wow, man, geez, he's part of my community. Crazy. It's just like, wow, you know, people die. Right? None of us get out of here alive is the word so i'm sitting with this for the whole week and my wife and i went up to mendocino which was an already a planned trip and on the day i was supposed to get results i'm waiting and no call supposedly the physician is going to call i'll we'll call at 9 a.m i'll we'll call at 10 a.m 11 a.m a call it's happening yes the results have come in i can't say anything we don't you know we have to wait for the physician to call back okay Please have him call. 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 1.30, call up again. Now what? And I'm waiting for this, and it's like, it's hard to stay in my body. And then 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, call again. Call back. 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, no call. And I'm thinking, wow, is he just waiting to the end of the day because is he, he knows this is going to take a long time? You know how the mind, the monkey mind, can go wild with this. And <laughs> uh, with all my practice, I didn't think I was doing very well that day, frankly. Uh, and then I wound up calling again and got an after-hour person, and then he wound up getting on. And he says, he says to me, Mr. Ellenberg, I'm both 
surprised and delighted to tell you that you're okay. Right? There was a tiny little bit, thank you. There was like a tiny little bit of non-invasive in one particular part. So there's nothing, there's no treatment, there's nothing to worry about at this point. We'll just be checking. And I just had my first PSA test since then, and it was actually lower. So, you know, on one level, you know, I escaped the inevitable, but it, I really looked at it like um, a dress rehearsal, you know, in a certain way, because sometimes it's not going to, it won't be those results. But it got me thinking really a lot more about death. I mean, I actually am one of these people who thinks about death a lot. You know, having a father who died at 49 years old when I was 10, you know, and having cousins, like a lot of, there was a lot of death early in my life from people who I knew. And so it's, it hasn't, I haven't been shielded, you know, shall we say, from the inevitable. And as I, as I reflected on it, I wanted to just share more with you about that because this, this is a topic, you know, I thought about talking about back then, but it felt too close in a certain way. But now I feel some readiness to talk about it. I feel like we don't really talk enough about death, you know, in this culture, you know, and I think it's, it's a really important part of life. You know, it's been said that all Buddhism is, exists between two fundamental human realities. One is that we're going to die somewhere out there in the future. And the second is, we don't know when that's going to happen. We don't know when it's going to happen, and we don't know how it's going to happen. And that's a weird phenomenon, right? Like it's there. You know, in, in Carlos Castaneda, for some of the who you remember, uh, you'd say that death is always hanging by your your let over your left shoulder. In Hinduism, the god of Yama, you know, is always right behind you. It's there, right? And so on some level, all of life exists in the backdrop of death all of being exists in the background of non-being and that's really the core of existential philosophy and existential psychology you know is the recognition that at any moment at any moment you can be taken out right it's a crazy thing to live with isn't it it's crazy but it's true that's reality that's what we live with i one of my closest friends not named Rick, uh, his wife found out just suddenly that one of her best friends died in a car accident. Some truck went over the line and just like that. It's devastating. And you just don't know. And I'm sure all of you have examples of someone or some time where someone just got super sick and died. And, and you know, some of you are probably dealing with some pretty significant health conditions yourself. You know, and this is part of the challenge of life and is certainly a big part of the core of practice is I think it's really part of why we practice. There's actually a term in psychology called terror management. I mean, it's like, the, and it's related to the terror that most people feel about death. Now, most people do all kinds of things to deny it, you know, and to keep it at bay, but it's there, you know, on some level and denial is it, you know, it's a very human defense, it's a powerful strategy, but it's not always the best strategy. Um, Ernest Becker, who wrote The Denial of Death, really focused a lot on, this, obviously, the death territory. And he said, anxiety is the result of the perception of the truth of one's condition. What does it mean to be a self-conscious animal or human animal, as I like to call us? This is the terror to have emerged from nothing, to have a name, you know, names, to have a name, consciousness of self, deep inner feelings, an excruciating inner yearning for life and self-expression, and with all this yet, to die. Wow. The Buddha said, of all the footprints, that of the elephant is supreme. Similarly, of all mindfulness meditation, that on death 
is supreme. And I've, I've actually added that into my practice, increasingly so, you know, over the time. And I find it actually strangely free, right? And so he was, he was known to have said to his, some of his disciples, he said, let me ask, how often do you reflect on death to some of the monks that were his followers? And he looked at the first one, and the first monk said, at least once a week. And the Buddha shook his head. And then he asked the next one, how often do you think about death or reflect on death? And this monk said, every day. And then the Buddha kind of shook his head. And then he asked the next monk, and he said, how often do you reflect on death? And the monk said, every hour. And the Buddha kind of shook his head and went on to the next one. And he asked the next one, how often do you reflect on death? And the monk said, every moment. And then the Buddha kind of shook his head and he said, once you contemplate death with every breath. Now, for most of us, that wouldn't be terribly possible because there's too many things we're doing. We're in the midst of doing tasks and things like that. So it's this would be more of a monastic life where that's all you're doing. Basically, you're meditating, you're sitting, sitting meditation, walking meditation, sitting meditation, walking meditation, cooking meditation. So it's all all that, all practice 24-7. And I don't think most of us are accorded that, that option. But to really be thinking about that reality of just having that be part of your practice and part of your life. Now, I'm sure most of you are aware of how the Buddha came to see the cycle of life. And he lived a very privileged life as a prince. And one day he was outside the castle and he saw an old person, a sick person, a corpse, and he also saw an aesthetic. And those actually became the, the foundations of the heavenly messengers, you know, that they are all part of life, right? And so in the meditation, I, I stated these, and I'm going to say, say them again, you know, which is just like everyone. I, I'm starting to really do this with myself. Just like everyone, I am of the nature to age. And I can see it. Like, I'm almost 70 years old, and... I'm not 20, nor 30, nor 40. You know, it's like, I remember when I first started needing reading glasses, and I was just fighting against that, you know, for, when I was 40, 41. Now I have reading glasses everywhere. I can't even imagine. I have 28-point font right now, so I don't have to wear glasses as I'm, as I'm speaking with you. Just like everyone, I am of the nature to sicken. I have not gone beyond sickness. Sickness happens. You, know, you don't know when that's going to happen or to what degree it's going to happen. Just like everyone, I am of the nature to die. I have not gone beyond dying. Right? And so it's, it's again sitting there. Just like everyone, all that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will change. There are meditations, you know, where uh, on on death, where literally you you know picture a plateau or, or a plane, and then you imagine something that's very pleasing to you, someone who you're really connected to, and then imagine that person just disappearing forever. Your sacred objects, beautiful, you're so attached to them, disappear, and just watching the disappearance of all that you love. Now, for many people, they think, how morbid could that possibly be? Right? I mean, that doesn't sound like fun. Gee, sign me up you know, for that. But we're going to see just how really important that is. Just like everyone, I am subjected to the results of my own actions, and I am not free from these karmic events. And to really be thinking about that, and I, I think about that as someone who... Uh, I would say I grew up in a fairly harsh environment. My father was a major rager, and that's part of why he died at 49. So I internalized that, and I was not nearly as kind to people as I, as I am now. 
you know, and I wasn't as kind to myself as I am now. And I can see that. And I'm just really, you know, every moment going like, am I going to give in to my irritations about somebody doing X, Y, or Z? And I try to remember that, wow, you know, that person is, is subject to the same laws that I am, the same human laws that in the end really are going to impact us to, to, to the point where we're not even here, you know, obviously. And there's going to be stressors, obviously, along the way. I think a lot of times people become intoxicated, you know, with clinging to life, you know, holding on for dear life. And that's actually part of what happens even in meditation. When you think about your sitting and what is it that's actually stopping you from dropping in, right? It's de- it's a fear of death on some level, right? Because like to, to drop in really deeply, you're not there, you know, in a certain way. And this is what, what we were talking about when we, in, when we talk about no self and you know, looking, where's my self? There is no ultimately like letting go you're not there but what is there right and that's ultimately where we're going so we're really looking at how to how to live our lives skillfully and one of the biggest and most important ways of living life skillfully is to recognize these human realities and that's the reason why so many people really follow the teachings of buddha i mean some of my absolute favorite people on this planet are buddhists Right? And, live, and living living according to the precepts. You know, but in America, you know, whew, it's a very different thing. I I have a term you know, from from America. I call it youthaholism. You know, it's like this this addiction to youth. You know, to image, to persona, to the masks we wear. You know, and I'm really of the belief that if you really want to have true depth of connection you have to be open and i think about the word intimacy the phonetic of it of into me see to allow others to see into you you know when you think about when the buddha was talking about you know the three most important parts of life which is basically the you know the dharma um and the forgetting the other one suddenly but the sangha which is what you know where this is and sangha is really about relationships and and one of the things that's really interesting about relationships is that when you look at the whole territory of probably the most important human skill set there is resilience right it's basically resilience is really about how do you handle disruptive often unwanted changes in life you may have noticed that stuff happens uh, we have that lovely uh, bumper sticker that I, I like to think disruptive unwanted change happens as opposed to shit happens, right? But I don't think that's gonna, I'm probably not gonna see that bumper sticker. But that's a reality, it happens, you know? And so resilience is that ability to metabolize that and losing balance and to keep coming back. And meditation really helps us with that, you know? And, and I really, I'm really increasingly convinced about really sitting with that like I, I was sitting with and walking with the the inevitable like I, i'm like literally these days i'm like walking up steps in my house and go wow this is the last step is this i don't feel morbid about it i'm just trying to really get present you know in my experience with you know really the the underpinnings of life they so really believe when we look at the shadow of death long enough it can help us see the light of life, you know, and that's part of, you know, a big part of my message here today, and it can free us, you know, and so some of the things that we see in terms of really facing death are these wonderful qualities that emerge. One is that it reduces the suffering of attachment and emotional reactivity to change. When you hold on, constantly holding on, we tighten up, defending against, but if we actually just, it's already gone, on some level, and I, I'm not saying I'm there. I just want to be clear about that. I'm on my own path with this. I'm I'm like a student teacher basically, but I'm you know I'm really working with this. It's like I gotta go. It actually, can be freer in your body, and it increases gratitude 
for the preciousness of each moment. Because you know, so many of us are waiting for the great experience in life. It's it's out there somewhere. Else. It's coming. I know it's coming. One day it's going to be there. And then it's not. Right? What are we waiting for? What are we actually waiting for? And it increases gratitude. You know, as I said, for the preciousness of each moment and the acknowledgement of impermanence leads us to greater compassion and self-compassion. I think that's part of what happened for me at the end of the meditation when I was looking at you all. Uh, I just had this deep sense of appreciation you know, for you being human, you know, for the challenges of just being alive and just felt you know, love and compassion and toward myself as well. And it decreases trite feuding and taking offense. The Buddha was known to have said, people other than the wise do not realize we in the world must all die. And the wise realize this, and therefore of their quarrels cease. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean not speaking up. If, if you feel some injustice happening or if someone you know, so stepped on your toes doesn't mean not asserting yourself or speaking up for yourself, but it does mean doing it in as kind a way as possible. I really believe that boundaries and healthy boundaries are a part of life, but sometimes people have these boundaries that are too tight, right? They get so reactive, and that's that's actually how I used to be. So I'm I'm a super different person than I used to be in terms of my own boundaries. Diminished. Death anxiety helps us support others during the dying and grieving. You know, my mother-in-law was living with us and I'd sat with her as she was dying. It was quite, quite remarkable and intense. And it allows us to live with greater peace and anxiety. And all of these lead to greater vitality and joy. The Buddha in the Dham Dhammapada said, perception of impermanence grows in him or her while beings who have not developed mindfulness of death fall victim to fear, horror, and confusion at the time of death. He or she dies undiluted and fearless without falling into such a state. Now, there's, there's a, a researcher who's really looking into the mindfulness practice of, of death, and he said, in the future, I hope that many experts in the diverse fields will study the application of mindfulness of death and its positive effects on life. So I ask you to take a moment to reflect what really scares you about death. Just take a moment to go inward. And I'm going to give you 30, 45 seconds to breathe. And go, what, what? You can ask yourself, what scares me about death and about dying? And even what would you regret if now is your time? I'm going to be finishing this talk in a, in a couple minutes, and those of you who want to share or ask questions, but you may want to share anything that came up for you, you know, with the Sangha at that time. And also, for those of you who are going to stay afterward, I'm sure you have a great opportunity to share with George and Tom, you know, and I'm not sure else who else is going to be part of that, you can just, you know, what's come up for you, because I think this will be a great opportunity to do some, some deep processing. So Bonnie Ware, who is an Australian palliative nurse out with many people who were dying, you may have heard of these, the five deathbed regrets. And she found that these were the five regrets that she heard most often. You know, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself and not the life others expected of me. Right? Two is, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Three is, I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. Four is, I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. And the last is, I wish that I let myself be happier. 
And there was another, uh, I think she's a therapist, a woman named Grace Blue Rock. She had nine, which I found interesting. And she said, talking about people, she said, they wish they had been more loving to the people who matter the most, right? That's a good one. Because you think about that. There are people who you love, but do you really show it? I've worked with, I mean, literally thousands of people over the years. And I can tell you that super common for when someone says, you know, I love my wife and my husband, my friend, my brother, you know. And I said, do you tell them? No. No. Really? You didn't say that? I mean, it's so important. And think about that. Who do you want to share share your love with? They wish they had been a better spouse, parent, or child. They wish they had not spent so much time working. They wish they had taken more risks. They played too safe. They wish they had been happier, enjoyed life more. There's consistency here. They wish they had lived their dream. They lived by others' expectations and not their own. They wish they had taken better care of themselves, which is really a way of loving yourself and honoring yourself and being kind to yourself. They wish they had done more for others. And they wish they had chosen more meaningful work. All right. Okay. So with that, I want to open it up. And so if you would like to ask a question, if you want to share anything that came up for you as a as a as a, as a potential regret, but also if you want to share maybe even a commitment you're making it to yourself, like I'm going to actually live my life more fully. And here's how I'm going to do that. The floor is open for you. All right, so Fran. So uh, about 11 years ago, my mother died after a very long illness. And uh, last week I found out that my sister, who's a few years older than I, uh, is in a vegetative state with the same illness. And I say to myself, this is something that uh, I'm the younger of, of two children. I, I think to myself, oh my goodness, you know, what am I going to do now if I have the same illness? It's, um, and I'm, I'm just trying to wrap my head around this, like uh, improve my lifestyle or get used to this concept that um, within a few short years or months, I could have the same devastating long illness. So your talk was very helpful to me and resonated. It was very frank and I like, I like that. Mm. Um, well, thank you for sharing that, Fran. And yeah, I mean, one never knows. And that that's the thing also, is like we, we can project the worst possible outcomes, you know, there quite easily. And that may not happen, right? You know, it's like the Mark Twain line, I've suffered a great many catastrophes. A, a few of them actually happened, right? You know, it's, there is a social satirist, forgetting his name from years ago. He said, 99% of things I've worried about never happened. And that proves that worrying works. I thought that that, that would be kind of perfect for my mother. <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, so, but at the same time, you know, Fran and anyone else who's kind of facing these things, it's like, this is an opportunity to really develop a deeper practice, right? And, and, and you may even want to be looking at different practices, uh, meditation practices on death. You know, so this is the opportunity in there because, you, excuse me, you can, you know, live in fright all the time and just be in that state that's not terribly skillful that most of us live in and face in situations like this. Excuse me. Or you can go, okay, I'm going to use this to deepen my practice. And I hope that, that you do use that for that for that uh, purpose. All right. So Brenda. Whoa. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh Golly, you know, you're almost 70. I uh, next month will be 81. Ah. My husband uh, is uh, just turned 87 in August. And he is now it's interesting that you mentioned the um, PSI, he's just had a very painful anal surgery, not that but uh, in any case, you, you're so delicate. 
and what you said about feeling yourself at a certain age, you know, it's so interesting. And my husband, who grew up during the war in Germany, he was German. Wow. Um, wow. He says that, and it's very interesting. He says that, you know, he's always thought about dying all the time. It's not death, but it's the dying. It's the dying. <laughs> And of course, so interesting when you said the thing about what we're doing always is a dress rehearsal. Both of us uh, were perfor are performers, and the idea of that your life is all just about you know rehearsing the end. But again, you never want to. Even though I feel we're all aware of it, as I know you are, and what you've talked about, we're never quite really. You can't really put your finger on it. You know, you can't really feel the depth of it right. and uh, that's the scary part for me you can't feel the depth of it always you know whatever you did you I would feel I would wish I had done more I wish I hadn't left a mess for somebody else to deal with right. you know, for our daughter for the grand you know all of that it's like the messiness is the thing that's so difficult but I thank you so much for this wow. Oh, very, very much. Yeah. It's so hard to talk about. And I think for many of us, it really hit us tonight. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. I feel you. I feel you. <laughs> and I feel you. Thank you. Ashe. Ah. Jerry. I woke up this morning and I'm around a lot of different groups. And one of the groups that passed up into my mind this morning as I woke up or something was my tennis group. And I began to feel, oh, wow, you know, I really love the people in that group. I mean, I really feel love for them. Right. And uh, it was like, wait a minute, tennis? Tennis group, love, caring? I really felt that this morning. And uh, it kind of made me realize, wow, there's a lot of groups that I feel love for. What a good life. I'm loving it. And, uh, anyway, it, it just kind of hit me in an unusual way. And uh, I'm grateful. Beautiful. That's that's. Thank you, you know, for sharing that, Jerry. And I think one of, the, one of the things that we oftentimes think about courage is like the courage to to speak your truth, you know, so to speak. And oftentimes, my my experience is when people think about that, they're thinking about talking about things they don't like. They, they don't like about some uh, treating them, you know, standing their ground or whatever that happens to be. I actually think that something that's at least as vulnerable is sharing love. And I can imagine like sharing with my your tennis group, like I love you guys. And the guys in particular have difficulties with so I love you, man. Love you, man. You know, <laughs> that, that's kind of like the best it gets, you know, in a certain way. And it does take a certain type of courage to really kind of step up and say, I care, you know, I really value you. And to me, that's one of the most important practices there is. And I really try to I try to live that way. I try to show my appreciation you know, for people and, you know, when somebody's touched me to really say it, don't, don't wait, don't wait. There's no waiting. There is waiting, but there doesn't need to be. All right. So thank you, Jerry. Okay. So I don't see your name, but Susan. I, hi, Susan. Hi. Thank you. It's been really nice listening to you tonight. Um, a few years ago, I woke up and my husband was dead in bed. He, he died suddenly. And the first thing that came to my mind was I didn't say I love you to him enough. I didn't actually say it. He was he was the opposite of me. He was like that. And I and I went through months thinking about that and just torturing myself. And then I realized that as I grew up, all my life I knew I was loved by my parents and my sister, but no one ever said in the family, I love you. I never heard those words. Right. So I'm now what I'm trying to do because I have little grandchildren. I I try. It's it's like a conscious thing. I have to make myself say I love you. Beautiful. And it's and the more I do it, the little bit easier it gets. 
I'm waiting for them to say it back to me. <laughs> they haven't done it yet, right. but um, but that's a selfish point of view. But um, it, and then I remember my father when he was 90. He was one of eight children. He's sitting in his chair and he said, "Yes, I grew up and I lived a long time. And I when I lived with my seven brothers and sisters and mother and father, no one ever said they loved me." And I always remember him saying that, and it just kind of brought tears to my eyes, but that's the reason I never said it either. So I guess it's part of trying to be kind to yourself and understand why you've done things and then try to make it better. Right. You know, and again, these go wake up calls, you know, they're wake up calls and to you know, really kind of get out there and be more vulnerable with your care you know, and mm. with words about that. I'm not speaking to you only i mean i think for for all of us we could be showing up more so thank you yeah. you're welcome Catherine. hi sorry um i i didn't expect to uh come to this talk about a topic of death um something right. i i processed a, a lot in um a few years ago um when my husband passed away um at home he was uh 36 oh my god um yeah it was um undiagnosed uh cancer oh. um and you know i saw a lot of messages today about you know um a lot of people saying about their own action how they take care of themselves and and you know, thinking about the consequences of your own action and how that might, you know, uh, lead to your death or your illness um, or, you know, messages about worrying about their family, what they would do, um, you know, after they died. Um, I, you know, I wanted to share my experience because I think it might bring a different perspective. So um, it was definitely very difficult uh, to uh, handle death, uh, sudden death uh, as a young, young person. I mean, we were married for about a year at that point. And, um, you know, it's something that you don't expect to happen in that stage of your life. Right. And, um, and I was very fortunate and I think it's, this is the kind of event that really helps you realize that, um, you know, you don't truly live alone in this world. There are a lot of people who are very loving and really wanted to help you um, to process and to navigate in, um, in this mm -hmm. kind of uh, experience, mm -hmm. um, whether it's as the estate, uh, you know, and your like finances and like, belongings and, and all of those things um I think that was my first lesson um from his death mm -hmm. um the other piece that I found it it was really as hard as it was but it was also helped me realize that no one wants to be remembered for their death they want to be remembered how they made you feel Right. Right. So right. I think when we think about our death, it's not so much about, you know, how can I help that person or like, oh, I'm going to make them suffer so much. But it's more like, how can I leave like loving memories and experiences Beautiful. with that person? So that would become uh, a life of memories. Um Beautiful. You know, it's it's that person's legacy. Is right. I'm um, sorry, right. maybe I'm just a bit confused, but like it's, and I I think that's really that's really my my and another learning about living. It's how do I make people that matter to me feel? Right, right. Which is a great question, right? Right, and and the whole process of death is definitely very terrifying, and I don't think. There's anything that can ever prepare you to witness and process, um, uh, you know, death. And and then within it, that one year, 
one of my closest friends uh, decided to do medically assisted uh, dying after 10 years of uh, terminal lung disease uh, suffering. And, um, yeah. and I attended her very beautiful party, her last party. Um, and we had a lot of conversation about life, living, and death. And, you know, the from her, I learned a lot about the value of, of death. And sometimes this death is quite, make no sense because she was only 44. But you don't, no one should be thinking about things like that um, at 44. Um, I but I think, you know, I, I truly believe that, you know, sometimes it's experiences like this is actually Wake up. part of the bigger life lessons. Right. right. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. I, I appreciate your sharing. All right. I, I think we have time for one more. Um, so Lynn from Calgary. Hello. So you have to keep this a little bit briefer. So. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, I'm in Calgary. A <laughs> um, couple things. Um, first of all, I, I'm just so taken by your honesty. I, that touches me. Uh, telling about the tests and stuff. Um, that's, thank you. Um, I was raised in a family where death was just always sort of my mom's preoccupation. She was going to die every day. And not only was she going to die, she it was because we were such terrible kids. She was going to get sick and go to the hospital and die. And and the humorous part is she lived to be 95. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a bit of a preoccupation for me. And, and I realized I wasn't going to come tonight. And then I you know looked at the clock and here I am. Um, I have a sister who fell recently, ended up in rehab. Uh, I don't think she's going to die, but it, she's heading in that direction. And I've spent days just crying, and I'm not even sure why. Mm -hmm. um, for her loss, for my loss, for who's ever loss, um, and some things in my own life that if, you know, my body is hurting and I got to move and I don't have the money and da 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 da. Um, but the thing that came to mind, because there's some people I need to talk to that I love, Stephen Levine's, if you knew you didn't have much time, who would you call? Exactly. Right. What would you say? And why are you waiting? Right. Exactly. That's that's really one of the big lessons is, is really don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait. All right. Well, thank you all very much. I really, really appreciate your your openness. And um, this is, I've never given a talk about death before, <laughs> so this was a first, you know, for me of many talks I've given over the years. So I appreciate your attention. I really just I wish you abundance on all levels, and I really, I really am. I root for you to to open in the midst of impermanence. So thank you very much.